Mobile hunters, if you're interested in upping your mobile game, then head to tetherednation.com and check out their saddle gear. There are a few things you can actually buy that will help you become a better deer hunter or give you the freedom to hunt any tree or any situation. This is the reason why I started saddle hunting in the first place and why I use Tethered's gear. I can honestly say that Tethered's saddle gear has changed how I hunt for the better. Big tree, little tree, from the ground, it doesn't matter. I'm untethered by my gear to hunt the best setup for the situation, instead of hunting for a tree that my gear can use. My current core setup consists of the Phantom Saddle, Tethered One Sticks, and the Predator Platform, along with an assortment of their accessories. So if you want to up your mobile game, head over to tetherednation.com. If you're like me, you spend lots of time poring over maps, looking at weather data, all in an effort to help predict when and where my best times to hunt will be. It'd be nice if there was a reliable source with all this information in one place. Enter the Spartan Forge app. Unlike some other predictive apps on the market, Spartan Forge was created from military combat intelligence experience tailored for hunters and stands at the nexus of machine learning and white-tailed deer hunting. No more man-made algorithms. This is a predictive model based on real GPS collared deer data, historical and predictive weather, and the next level of mapping imagery, all at my fingertips. I've been using the iOS app this season, and it has replaced all my other mapping tools. Visit SpartanForge.ai and sign up today, or head to your iOS or Android app store. Use the promo code TRUTH to save some money and download it today. Welcome to the Truths from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 273. Today I'm joined by Carl Kasuth. We are going behind the scenes of Tethered with the sewing madman himself and talk a little saddle hunting, gear, and bow hunting with traditional archery equipment. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. Hope you guys are getting out into the woods doing some postseason scouting, getting your checklist kind of taken care of. I made another attempt this past weekend. It was actually probably the longest session I had uh, in the timber uh, this past weekend, which was which was good. There was an area I wanted to explore. I had, I had checked into it maybe, I want to say, two years ago. And, um, it wasn't great at that moment, uh, but I knew it, it might get a little bit better if I gave it another year or two. So I did that and, um, went and made a, a slog through a particular area. It was kind of a long hike. The, the one area I wanted to check was a complete bust. Um, well, I shouldn't say a complete bust. It gave me one more puzzle piece as to how I think a deer and a particular deer is kind of using this one, this one area. Um, it was a little ways away from where I know where he's spending time and I have him in daylight and I'm just trying to put the rest of the puzzle pieces together. I want to get a picture of like how this deer is moving. And the sad part of it is, is I don't even know if this deer is still alive. Um, I think I've mentioned this before. He, he showed up in summer, didn't see him any other time. I saw him, I think only twice during the summer. So it wasn't like he was a freak, uh, a frequent flyer. Um, and then he showed up in the fall and he stuck around, you know, from like mid September all the way through the end of uh, October and then became a phantom again. And I've never I've never seen him since. Um, so he he may very, very well have have gotten killed. I would find it hard to believe that you that someone wouldn't necessarily hear or that I wouldn't have heard about it necessarily um, just based on the, the you know, the, the quality of the animal. Um, and so I'm operating under the assumption that he's still alive until he doesn't show back up on camera at some point this summer. So anyway scouted this one area because I thought it might hold a, a additional intel. I don't know that it's necessarily sign that I picked up that was his, uh, but it was in alignment with some uh, sign that I had found in another area. And it's when I look at a map, it kind of starts to connect all the pieces together where it's like, well, this is kind of how he's traveling and what is his fall kind of core, um, core area. And then I just, I was looking on the map and there was another area that I had looked at, you know, probably again about two years ago and I hadn't been back there. Um, and I was like, eh, you know what? I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm close to it. You know, I don't want to make this whole hike back in to come back in in another session just to scout this one area, especially if it, it may or may not be any good. So while I'm here, let me just go ahead and, and make my way back there and, 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 and check out this other area. Um, and I did, and I think it's good from a holding does perspective. Um, there wasn't any sign. Now there was some sign on like at this one entrance point that I kind of walked into, there was a funnel, uh, a little pinch that was there. Um, and it looked very reminiscent to some of the sign that I was seeing in another area related to this deer that I'm kind of obsessing over. Um, 
And so uh, I ended up hanging a camera at that pinch, um, you know, hoping maybe that I, you know, catch some summer pictures of this deer or, or, or whatever the case is. But I have a good feeling that I've found where his early summer uh, kind of range is and maybe even his, his, you know, late, late winter range, you know, potentially, um, you know, so that, that remains to, uh, remains to be seen, but it's a, it's a good little spot, a good little setup. Um, it's a ways back in there. <laughs> um, you know, so it would be one of those places that I'd probably get maybe one hunt out of it, uh, in a given year, um, just based on how far it is to, to get back to it. Um, you know, I'm certainly not going to throw hunts at it willy nilly. It's, I'd be going in there with some, with some Intel that I think I can go in and, and, and uh, and kill. Um, just cause quite frankly, aside from taking days off of work during the week, it's way too far for me to, to make the hike either before work or, um, or after work, um, in the morning or in the evening. So it'd really just be a day off or, you know, a weekend Saturday type of, uh, type of scenario. And, you know, I may only get those right conditions once, maybe twice during the course of the season for that particular, for that particular spot. So net net was, it was a pretty good scout. And I, I stumbled across one other thing as I was kind of leaving that I need to go check out. And then this particular area, I'll kind of be done with it. Um, in that I have it completely kind of broken down at this point and, uh, know what the game plan is for there. And then I'll start to kind of hit some other spots. Um, and then just certainly waiting for the weather to kind of give me the chance to go, uh, visit my, my travel piece here in PA. Um, it's not quite right yet. It still has some ice and we just got a little bit more snow. So who knows when that might be like a June thing. Um, but I'm actually going to be taking a turkey hunting trip to, uh, to this particular spot with my home, my, uh, my homeboy, my road dog, Chad, I think he's actually going to get a PA turkey tag. And I think we're going to do a little mountain turkey hunting this year, take a couple of days off of work and, uh, go do that here in PA. He's a spring gobbler. You can hunt till noon. Uh, I think it's during the first, uh, first two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the rest of the day you can't hunt. So, you know, we'll hunt half a day for turkeys and then scout some, uh, some mountain bucks, uh, for the rest of the afternoon. So it'll probably be like a Saturday you know, scout all day Sunday and then hunt slash scout, uh, Monday, Tuesday. So I think tentatively that is the plan. But speaking of Chad and speaking of cameras, uh, have a cool thing here. You guys might want to take advantage of an interesting opportunity that, uh, my buddies from Exodus shared with me. So for the first time ever, they're offering a trade-in program for the remainder of March, uh, to get involved. You need to have an Exodus camera registered in their database. Uh, you can trade in any lift, lift to, or Trek and lock in a $100 savings off the Exodus render or the render bundle. If you like the idea of trading up and who wouldn't, here's what you'll need to do. Go to exodusoutdoorgear.com, use the code trade up all one word, T R A D E U P at checkout to lock in your $100 savings. After the order, the Exodus team will email you a shipping label with the order number for reference to your email. Print the return label, put it on a box, put your camera in the box that you're trading in, and ship it back to Exodus. After Exodus gets the camera, they'll ship you your new camera that you ordered. That was a lot to kind of take in all at once, so if it was a little hard to follow, just me kind of voicing it over, you can head to the link in the podcast show notes and follow the instructions there. Uh, they'll have all that information on their website. So with that, have a cool share for you guys today. Have my buddy Carl Kasuth on. Uh, if you don't know Carl, uh, Carl is one of the masterminds behind Tethered. Uh, he is their, uh, you know, he, I think he referred to it in the podcast as soft goods. So anything basically that's sewn that they have, uh, Carl is kind of responsible for, you know, prototyping and, and, and building and, and, and stuff like that. Um, they take a kind of collaborative approach whenever they're ideating and, and innovating and coming up with new gear and stuff like that. And, you know, an idea can kind of come from anywhere. They go, they test things extensively with, you know, guys like myself and other, other folks that kind of, um, have been working with tethered for a handful of years to kind of beat the gear up and test it and tell them what, what you like, what you don't like, what might need to change. And then they kind of go back to the lab and do that stuff. So Carl is kind of like the, you know, the brains behind a lot of the, the development and stuff like that. But as he explains, it's very much a collaborative effort where they're just trying to look for the best ideas. Um, you know, when those best ideas kind of come about, it then becomes kind of Carl's job or charge to figure out how you actually make those things come to life, um, and actually, and actually build it to where it's going to, you know, withstand the abuse that it needs to be able to withstand and, and, and then meet the needs of the, uh, of the mobile hunter and the, uh, and the saddle hunter. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and just jump into today's show with Carl. It was super awesome, uh, super awesome session. Hope you guys dig it as much as I did. And as always, thank you all for listening. 
All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I am joined by a buddy of mine. Uh, he is the sewing me- machine messiah, a.k.a. the Juki Jungle Master, Mr. <laughs> Carl Kasuth of Tethered. What's going on, man? Hey, man, how's it going? Good. I actually sat down and spent mental energy trying to come up with your nickname before the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Greg's always called me the, the Michael Jordan of sewing. The Michael- what was that? said the juki what the juki jungle master oh my gosh that might be like the best thing i've ever heard <laughs> right yeah i was That's like good. I, 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 my first thought was i went to the uh sewing machine messiah you know i liked that one then i was like well i know he uses a juki of course i was like so i need to try to figure out how to, and this is like a this is like a thing with me a nickname thing it's uh when i have my buddy john on it's just a running kind of inside joke that i always try to come up with a new nickname every time i have him on the show and okay it, and it sometimes is related to things that are you know uh, are specific to him sometimes they're tangentially kind of connected to him <laughs> like, and i just okay. make something up but i did like these. these these actually might be my best ones so you actually got my best work here all right i appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> nice man so i know you're uh you're living in the lap of luxury um in a in a hotel and uh, uh living that rock and roll lifestyle but uh how's uh how show uh show season been so far man uh it's been fast and furious yeah and yeah we had we had touched on it you know in previous conversations it's it's not as glamorous as a lot of people think it is mm-hmm. there's a um there's there, there's just so much that goes into to doing these shows just from getting from point a to point b with the entire booth all the gear and then you know coordinating with people who are going to help out at different shows just the whole venue and there's a lot to it um but it is a lot of fun i don't you know i wouldn't have it any other way it, you know it's 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 just it's a really cool thing to experience um especially when you've you know you come from a different walk of life yeah. and then all of a sudden thrown into this and and then you just go out there and you make it happen. Yeah, yeah. And not to mention that we've kind of been away from people for almost the better part of two years. So even though it can be a grind, it's, it's you know, I got to hang out with you guys in Harrisburg for a little while. And it was just nice to be able to see people again in groups, doing what they like to do, conversing, meeting new people, just all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it, it's an, it was a welcome change. I'll put it that way. Yeah. If I don't have to do another Zoom meeting call, it won't be <laughs> <laughs> i know right like, man I, I, hey man i talk to you in person <laughs> right yeah. I, I know i know the, the sad part of it is man is i actually work completely remotely so my company is actually headquartered in in, in canada and so and i'm a full-time remote employee so i don't have wow. an, i don't have an office so i live permanently through a computer screen i mean i could be a hologram to everyone at work for all i for all they would know you know because <laughs> Actually, I, actually, a lot. I met them one. I met a group of them one time because we had a uh, a Christmas dinner in Philadelphia. Just like for those of us who live in and around the Philadelphia area that that are remote employees. Yeah. And so it was kind of like the island of. I guess it was like the dinner for all the misfits that don't actually have a place to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Essentially, is what it was. So that was the only time for work that I've seen it. But, but I agree with you, man. It's uh the Zoom calls are you know before it was like you would have a call because you had to figure something out. You know, now it's like I just get Zoom calls bombed on me all the time for things that don't really yeah. require a call. Like we could literally just like text each other really quick and figure it out, you know, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, they have they have their place for sure. But I've had so many Zoom calls where, you know, you spend your hour to you know, what you have, like an hour time limit or something on the, the Google Meet or whatever. it is. Right. And, and then at the end of the hour, I'm like, we didn't accomplish anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I know. But, That's... but no, it's. um it's it's awesome to be around people again and you know i like you said i am here in in the in a hotel so i'm at the iowa deer classic right now it opens tomorrow and this is our third year here at the iowa deer classic and the cool thing about the iowa deer classic is they haven't been playing any COVID games um, Mm. since it all started yeah Uh, they've been open for business uh, and they haven't missed a beat and it's been so refreshing it really really Nice. Yeah. I got to go to the Iowa classic. Uh, I think it was three years ago. It might be going on four years ago now. Um, Mm -hmm. I was out actually doing some shed hunting because I have a buddy, my buddy, John actually lives out there. Um, like in and around the Farmington area. And, uh, I was meeting up with him because I was shed hunting, you know, 
part of the weekend while I was there doing some Iowa Deer Classic stuff because I was actually scouting because I was I was drawing a tag that following fall for Iowa. Right. So I was kind of trying to get a you know jam everything in in that one in that one trip and it was a good time. So if I mean while you're there, man, if you have some time to go find some public land and go shed hunt, you might uh you might walk out with some with some Iowa white gold if you're lucky. It'd be so nice if I had the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's always the key phrase, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't have enough hours in my days anymore. I don't. I mean, I tear down here Sunday evening when the show closes, um, head home to Missouri. I'll be at home for a day and a half, and then I am right back out the door heading up to Minnesota for the deer class up there. Nice. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, what other shows are you guys uh, going to be at this year? Just so people out there that are listening, because this, this won't come out till probably after, well, of course, after Iowa. But uh, what other shows? You're going to Minnesota next, and then where else are you guys off to? Yeah, so we have got a ton of, of shows. I should have been more prepared for all of them. We had potentially over 20 different um events wow. on the book um the i'm actually looking at this yeah because i just don't know the timing of all of them i know ohio is a little later in the year and i'm sure you guys yeah will be, be there yeah well so so with the teaching trains i'll start i'll start with the teaching trains um we have scaled those back a little bit we're not doing near as many but the ones we are doing are going to be pretty big nice. um you know, so we so we, we went we were doing some prospecting, getting in the retail last year. Um, you know, Jay Sporting Goods and Vances and just in various ones. We were just kind of testing the waters and seeing how it went. And uh, the reception seemed to be really, really, um, really good. So, you know, at ATA we kind of went full tilt into retail. Right. And so we're we're actually kind of basing our TNTs around major not in major metropolitan areas, but around them. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, so we can we can draw as many people as we can that want to learn about saddle hunting, and we're trying to basically hold the teaching trains at one of the re- the the retail locations. So nice. basically, you know, we can set up, do our teaching trains right there in the foyers or outside or however it's going to turn out. And if if people want to, um, you know. Uh, get into the game right there they can just walk right into the store and and get get kitted out yeah so uh, but yeah we've got we've got at least half a dozen of those i think planned um in different locations nice and there's uh, a there's a tracker also on the website if i'm not mistaken that people can just kind of go check out and they'll have the dates that are there and you yeah. know and stuff like yeah. that so yeah yeah if people just pay, uh, watch watch the website um you know facebook instagram well, we'll have all that stuff um, updated um, as far as the actual retail shows. So, again, we're here at the, the Deer Classic in Iowa. Then we have the Illinois Deer Classic we're doing. Next weekend, I'll be up in Minnesota. And um, Is it, I think it's, Okay. Yeah, the, the Ohio one's later in the year. Are you guys going to be at that one? I think so. Okay. Um, I can't say 100% on that. We are going to be hitting several TAC events this year, the Total Archer Challenge events. Nice. Yeah, I know you guys are going to be at the one uh, Seven Springs and, well, not my neck of the woods. It's on the western side of the state, but out around out around the Pittsburgh area. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping to make it out there this year. Unfortunately, that date always falls right around my – it's either on the, the weekend before or the weekend after, typically, of my, uh, of my anniversary. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's like – Sometimes I can go, sometimes I can't. Just depends on where it kind of falls and 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 what's going right. on, you know. But but those are always yeah. those are always good events, man. Those are fun. Yeah, they're um, they're really cool. So last year was our first time getting into the TAC events, and the one in Seven Springs was the first one, and we had such a good time and just introduced so many people to it that I immediately went to Michigan the following weekend. Just they had a spot for me out there. And so I booked it and just went nice and yeah, I had a great time. So we, we've got several tentatively scheduled. Um, nice. Yeah. What's uh? what's, where is in your opinion, you know, and I don't know if like you can tell just like by like how much, you know, product is going to a specific area, but do you, do you have a sense of geographically where the, like where is the biggest group of saddle hunters live? Like, is there a particular state that you typically see, whether it's through like the teaching train events or, um, 
sales numbers or whatever where like saddle hunting just over indexes in, in this in this particular area man i would say michigan and pa pennsylvania hmm. for sure are two of the biggest right not surprising i mean two of the larger hunter number states just in general so that would make sense exactly exactly but it's um down south that can't be overlooked down in uh, georgia mm-hmm. mississippi i mean really it's you know it's no secret at this point saddle hunting's here to stay yeah uh, i'm a fad you know people have realized that this is just a very very efficient way to hunt from an elevated position you, you, you can't deny it mm-hmm. and when you look at especially let's just go east of the mississippi um it's just it's crazy how it's taken hold and every day it just grows more and more um and so much of that is is just word of mouth what i like to call parking lot demos Mm -hmm. dude i don't know how many of those i've done like (laughs) you know where i've like i i literally i was hunting i was in iowa hunting and um i walked out of this piece of public and uh there was this old timer that i ran into in a different area and he just happened to be driving by and saw my truck and pulled in and waited for me to come out of the woods. It, super nice. Good. His name's George he's from Kentucky. And, uh-huh. uh, I still have a number. We still text once in a while. Um, and, uh, he saw me coming out and he's like, man, he's like, I drive around all these different pieces of public around here. He's like, yeah, I drive around early. He's like, man, you're in before I get to there. And he's like, and then you ain't coming out till after I like, after I'm out, you know, he's like, you're dark to dark. And I'm like, yeah, we just kind of talking. And he was looking at me. He goes, you just uh, set up a bunch of presets in there, you know, on all these different pieces. Cause I mean, he saw me at like every different public piece, like how it was right. parked at, you know? So he was like, man, this guy must have like 20 stands hung and he's from out of state, you know? And I'm like, no, I was like, no, I was like, you know, I tear down and set up and tear down every set. And he's like, can you, you know, a tree stand? He's like, you just set up a tree stand every time. I'm like, no, I was like, I'm hunting out of a saddle. He's like, well, where's that at? And I was wearing, you know, I'm like, I'm wearing it. Like he was like, <laughs> he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And at that time I was just, two sticking, you know, I had a, I'd made a set of two sticks that I'd cut down from the previous sticks that I had. And so he's like, well, how are you climbing? So I basically went through a whole demo in the parking lot of my truck, like right yeah. there for him. And, uh, what we started talking about, cause he, I mean, this guy, I, I want to say he was 70. He was out on public land, still hunting by himself, like just getting after it. Nice. You know, nice. but the thing was, was like, you know, as we were talking, he still likes to hunt from elevated platform and in his home state in Kentucky, it, you know, some places that he has some presets or whatever he will. But usually when he travels, you know, he's, he's hunting from the ground for safety reasons, you know? Um, but when we started talking, he was like, I feel like I could use one of those and get elevated again while I'm out hunting, you know, solo. I'm like, well, yeah, man. I was like, you know, you would never be not as like, if you didn't want to be, untethered from the tree you don't have to be as like so while you're climbing it's like you can just move your tether with you and, and clip into your bridge and you don't have like if you slip like it'll catch you like no big no big deal you know right. and i literally was driving home and uh he texts me a picture and he uh had a whole tethered setup so i was pretty stoked that like the old time and that's actually one of my favorite things to do is actually get older guys into it to be honest with you yeah. um i have a good buddy he's my kind of my bow hunting mentor and he's retired now um, actually you guys hooked him up last year for his retirement gift. Uh, Taylor sent me like a whole kit for him to send him off into retirement. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So appreciate that. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he taught me essentially kind of how to bow hunt and mentored me. And I wanted to make sure he was going to be able to stay in the woods for as long as possible. You know? Right. Um, you know, cause prior to that he was carrying climbers and stuff like that. And I was like, man, you can shed that and just carry a couple things with you. And I was like, you'll be able to hunt mobile and do the things you want to do for as long as you want to essentially. And so, um, this was his first year doing it and he was, he was pretty excited. So it's definitely, you know, it's not just a young man's game or a young person's game. I try to tell people that, you know, it's like, it's, I almost find value in it as more value in it as I get older, to be honest. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, he wants, you, you get to a point, you just don't want to pack that crap around anymore. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, saddle hunting in general you know, just as a, as a general rule, it lends itself to ditching all of that stuff. And it's not, it's, an, it's not, you don't have to be a super athlete to do this, mm-hmm. you know, with the, the climbing sticks or even single sticking like I do. Um, I've turned on a ton of people to single sticking. And when you look at them, you know, you're like, uh, I don't even know if this guy can climb a ladder, 
you know, but right. it's, 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 it's simply technique. That's all it is. It's technique and taking your time and just enjoying the climb, focusing on the climb. It's no secret. I, and I, and I tell everybody, I love the climb. Um, I love picking out stupid trees, you know, with mm-hmm. lots of stuff. And that's, to me, the climb is, is just as a big a part of the, as the actual hunting for the, for the deer, you know? Yeah. And you, yeah, you don't have to be a, a rock star to, to do this. And, and that's, what's really cool is like you said, cause a lot of, of people who are getting up in their years can do this. It's, and it's not a race. That's yeah. one big thing I, I, I really try to preach. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of stuff on social media, especially, um, where a guy will say, I'm using, I'm using spurs or I'm using a single stick or I'm using three sticks with eighters or whatever the combination might be. And inevitably you'll see somebody ask the question, well, how fast is it? How right. fast? Is it? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter. It's, um, to me, it's how quiet can you be? That's it, just it, it right there. It, it doesn't matter how freaking long it takes you. How quiet can you be? And I tell people church mouse quiet. That's the goal. And you do that and you'll be golden. I mean, last year, perfect example in Southern, uh, Southern Illinois, when Greg and I were hunting out in public, I literally, I'd scouted out a buck bed. The wind got right for that buck bed and I went to go hunt it and I started climbing the tree. I was literally about 10 feet up single sticking and I heard the buck cough in the bed and I'm like, Oh crap, he's there. <laughs> right. And so I look over, pull out my glass and I see tines and I was like, yes, he's there. So I am 70 yards away from this buck. And I was actually able to finish my climb and get up above 25 feet, 70 yards from this dude. And it's just because I was being quiet. It was not a race. It, it took me probably 20, 25 minutes to get up there, which normally takes me four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the, the whole thing. My buddy and I call it, you know, everyone, you know, uh, whatever, whatever terms they want to use for it, you know, they'll hang and hunt or whatever. Like we kind of like to refer to it as mobile stealth. Because if you don't, if you're mobile and you're not quiet, it doesn't really matter, you know? And, Correct. and so, and, and you sold me on one stick. And so I, I was, I watched your video this summer and, um, I was like, man, I was like, I kind of want to try that, you know? And so I, I tried it, you know, a couple of times, got, got some gear. And my first kind of impression was at first I was like, this is definitely something that's going to be in my arsenal. Probably mm-hmm. going to be something when I go out of state because I usually go out of state blind and I'm doing a lot, a lot of walking and scouting. I was like, and then it's just less stuff I have to carry, you know, with me. Um, but my thought was, and this, and I'll get to the point that you made here in a second. But my thought was originally where I was like, man, I'd probably really only use it during the rut because I can get away with a little bit more movement and a little bit more noise because the deer aren't quite keyed in yet. Like they're not thinking correctly. Right. So I can, I can get away with just a little bit more because I was like, I'm not sure if I can do this as quiet as I would like to. Well, like right. two hunts into the season, I was like, man, screw these two sticks. Give me the single stick. And then I was good <laughs> for the rest of the way, you know, and climbed yep. into some pretty tight places, man, you know, in, in and around deer and, uh, you know, had great encounters this year. And, you know, and now it's, that's the only way I'll, that's the only way I'll do it now at this point. I don't want to use more than one stick. Yeah. I've, um, I've been climbing single stick style exclusively for the last two seasons, at least full complete now you know i haven't touched multiple sticks or any other climbing method and it's it's just what works for me you know uh, i mean one of the benefits is your it's literally just a stick so the the fear of banging it around on other sticks while you're climbing is not even there because there's no other sticks right uh, and like so literally if i'm going on a if i'm going on a down and dirty like two hour hunt just quick in and out i wouldn't even take a platform i'm the same way i'll, I'll do the same I'll thing hunt off the stick so at this point if i'm doing that i am literally wearing my entire climbing hunting and descending system on my butt um because you know that that little one stick that i use it's a modified a shortened one stick with a three-step aider on it still weighs one pound it fastens right on my roll-up pouch on my right side um with my 40 foot rope in there, the whole, I got everything I need. I'm wearing it, everything I need to climb, to hunt and descend, um, off that one stick. And we're talking, I'm at three pounds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is too, it's like, I, I like, like you, I like the climb, you know, it's just a fun part of the hunt for me. 
Um, mm-hmm. But the biggest selling point for me on the on one sticking was, I mean, I like the fact that it, it weighs next to nothing. And to one stick, I use a, a tethered one stick as well with the a, a three step aider that I made that I just attached to the bottom. Um, yeah. And uh, it was more less the weight for me and more the bulk. You know, uh, you and I were both not vertically gifted. <laughs> I'm, I'm a relatively right. short guy. And so it's always been less about the weight for me and more just about the width of things and the bulk of things. Cause I'm just not a very wide or tall guy, you know? Right. So my, my profile walking through the timber is one way. And then if I'm carrying like a climber or something like that, well, I got to account for that. However many inches on either side or above my head that I don't usually have to account for. So that's, that was kind of like the one you know big thing for me, but the sketchiest part for me always was when I'm done with a hunt at night, and then having to descend, regardless of whether I was using sticks or sticks with aider, movable aiders or whatever the case was, that was always the part where I was always, you know, having to be the yeah. most cautious for obvious reasons. And especially if you had like a little bit of rain or whatever the case was, um, you know, because my goal every day when I go out to hunt is always to come home. Like <laughs> that's the main sure. that's the main goal, you know. Um, and then once I started one sticking, it was like it just took that one part of the hunt out that always like would in the back of my mind be like, oh man, it's going to be dark. I got to climb out of here. It's just like, I got to be careful and just having to remind myself. Now yeah. I just like, the only thing I have to remind myself is to make sure I take like my clip off my, <laughs> off my tether so I can retrieve it <laughs> when I get yeah. to the ground. Cause I'm just going to Batman out of that tree and there's no chance yeah. of me, you know, of me falling, you know, or slip in or whatever the case is. And you bring up a great point there with repelling down. So it's, and I will argue this till the cows come home. There is not a safer way to descend out of a tree than repelling with a mad rock safeguard. Something that you have control over. You can it has a break on it, the lever. You have absolute control over what you're doing, however fast or slow you want to go. Um, there's just not a safer way to get out of the tree. And especially, let's say you're climbing a straight tree, um, for instance. From the time you hook up, climb the tree, hunt the tree, and descend the tree, you have never left that one line. Yep. You're on that same line the entire time. And it's just such a great, safe feeling coming down the tree, especially in the dark. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's stats out there. I don't know what the exact numbers are now. I used to, you know, but the majority of falls, whether it's on a mountain, a roof, a tree, a, a building, it doesn't matter. It, it happens when people are coming down. Yeah. Very rare. Yeah. Most of the majority of accidents and falls happen coming down because you can't see your feet. You well, that and you're foot. relying on gravity at that point, too. Usually whenever you're going up, like you're reaching up and grabbing something. Right. You know what I mean? And so when you're coming down, it's like the part that you can't see, you're you're allowing gravity to work for you to a degree where right. when you're going, when you're ascending, you're actually you have more control because you're actually working against gravity. Right. And you're looking at where you're getting ready to put your foot because you've already put your hand on it more than likely. Exactly. You know? Yep. You're going down, you're, you kind of got your foot out there like a little a feeler, you know, or a tentacle trying to feel around. <laughs> yeah. How many times have I tried to like lower myself down partially and try to wiggle my foot into my movable aider and I try to step into it and I'm like, I should be catching now. Oh, my foot's not in it. Let's get back up. Like <laughs> so many times, yeah. you know? Yeah. But man, I wanted to ask you, you know, we were talking about the teach and train things and we got kind of side, side rail there off the guardrails there to kind of dive down the wormhole of one sticking. But, uh, well, up now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that? You, you you take offense to the side the the side rail comment? No, no. I said I've got I've got the, the all the TNT events the tentative ones pulled up now. While we were off on our single stick. Oh, tangent. there you go. All right. Well, let, unload <laughs> unload them. Let's hear them. Let's see what you got. All right. So we've got uh, tentative TNT events. We're looking at uh, back here again in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, July sixteenth. Nice. Uh, then we've got Jay Sporting Goods in Claire, Michigan. That'll be July 30th. That was We did that one last year. It was awesome, awesome, awesome one. Um, that particular Jay Sporting Goods is, is a really cool store. Um, we have one in Pennsylvania that's still open for discussion and a date still open on that one. We're going to do a, a big one in near Chicago, Illinois at the bowhunting.com headquarters. Oh, nice. That's going to be on August 13th. Uh, we're going to be somewhere around Kentucky in August. Madison, Wisconsin in August. Uh, those are just, just August for now. I don't have anything locked in. 
possibly Atlanta, Georgia, and then Vance is outdoors in Ohio. That one looks like August 27th. Nice. So you guys are going to make a good, a good, a good little run, a good little tour coming yeah. to, coming to a city near you type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then of course we got all the, the, the tax, tax shows. Gonna, yeah. 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 Nice. It's, so I'm curious, man, with those teach and train things, you know, I, I think one of the things that makes hunting or just mobile hunting and passionate bow hunters kind of unique, at least in, in, in my mind or what I've learned at least, or have picked up on over years of doing the podcast is that no matter how long you've been doing something, there's always a little nugget or something that you learn from showing someone who doesn't know some of the things that maybe, you know, and then you see how they do something differently. You're like, well, damn, I didn't think about that, you know, or maybe you thought about it, but, but you, you know, it, you haven't thought of it in years or whatever the case is. I always give the example of, I was talking to Andre DeQuisto at the Iowa show the one year and we were just talking deer hunting and I was explaining to him how my kind of season played out. And here's a guy who's killed monsters all of his life, right? And, you know, record quality deer. And he was sitting there listening to me intently, you know, about what I was talking about. And, he, and then he started asking me questions, which is really interesting because this guy has had 30 times, 100 times more success than I've ever had, probably will, will ever have. Yet he was interested in what I was seeing, what I was learning, what I kind of picked up from these different hunts because those guys are always on a search for like the nugget that's going to help them the next hunt or whatever the case is. And I think right. about that the same way with like, whether it's gear or whatever, it's like, you know, I, I don't poo poo anyone's idea of like, Hey, this, this works for me. Well, I want to check it out because I might be able to use it or adapt it or use a part of it or whatever the case is. So I'm curious during all these events, you guys have, you meet so many people, whether it's at these shows, whether it's at the teaching train events or whatever, what's the biggest thing that you've learned from not someone who, you know, works at Tethered or whatever the case is, but just like the normal average person that comes to visit you guys, what's one of the biggest things you've learned or one of the key takeaways that you've had? I think, well, that's a tough question, man. Um, I, I, I guess probably the biggest thing that I've, that I've recognized and, and all of the people that I've met along the way is the absolute open-mindedness that somebody has to have to even approach the booth to begin with mm -hmm. and because if you think about it we eat sleep and breathe this mm -hmm. you know this is what we do but you get regular you know billy bob or joe coming to the booth and man they're they're taking a leap a leap of faith and I, it's some some days you think all is lost in the world right you have no <laughs> hope for humanity, right? yeah yeah exactly <laughs> You have these people come by and the just they are like sponges just ready to soak up every little every syllable that you that you say about this um you know what is you know as far as saddle hunting goes and it's just so neat to see how people are people are a lot more willing to adapt than they're given credit for as a, as a as a general rule yeah um that I found, um, and it's pretty refreshing. And maybe it's only in this arena. I don't know, because um, so many people are, are they get stuck in that status quo mentality, and, and this is the way we've always done things mentality. And it's really cool when you can make people step out of that box, and when they do it, they embrace it like wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, I, that that's probably the biggest thing I take away. It's more of a not really a technique type of thing there's more of a no i think that that's on point i think that that's on point though um you know because i think you're right i never really thought of it that way it made me think of something else as you were kind of talking which is because they're coming to you that way and and i was just i was reflecting on my experience of working the booth with you guys in harrisburg and just and then also reflecting on the times i've put someone in a saddle to check out as we were as we called them earlier parking lot demo sessions or whatever you know was that that open mindedness that they're coming to you with of, of intrigue or interest or whatever the case is, you know, there's a, you know, and I think it made me even think about this podcast. Like there's a, there's an amount of responsibility you have to that person because they're coming to you seeking unbiased kind of information, you know, like they're yeah. taking, they're making this leap of faith. They're, so they're kind of coming to you in a vulnerable way. Cause most people that approach saddle hunting, at least in my experience, come in 
with very, very little information or, or none, you know? Right. And so they're really coming to you and being vulnerable saying like, and I, and I, I there was a handful of people that happened at the booth in Harrisburg where they were literally coming saying like, Hey, I've seen this. I don't know anything about it. Can you tell me about it? You know? Right. And so it, there's a responsibility that you have, you know I mean? That in, in hindsight now that to give them and correct information to make good choices, essentially. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah, we're kind of, I guess you'd say stewards of the, of the sport in a way mm -hmm. or uh, of, of saddle hunting in general. And we never, ever, ever want to give anybody bad information, especially when it comes to their safety, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as, as a collective, all of us, you know, associated with tethered, whether it's Greg or Ernie or Taylor or Jared or me or any of our pro staff guys, Oh, we, we are very, very, intent on putting the best information we possibly can out there and at the same time like you touched on earlier if if somebody has done something different and it and it works for them but we always want to know about it you yeah. know because something we can use something we can pass on something we can throw into our our our, our repertoire so to speak um but yeah yeah people come to the booth it's usually one they're one extreme or the other either they have watched every single saddle hunting video on youtube and they're 99.9% .9 there. Now they just need to touch and feel it and mm -hmm. put their, and they're, they're, they're all in. Or they walk up to the booth and they have no idea what they're even looking at. And to me, the latter is the most fun because it, I love that expression. I, it never gets old. They, the first time that somebody leans back into a saddle that's positioned on them correctly, you know, it, we do so many of these demos. We, we, we can do it with our eyes closed as far as getting the tether height and all that stuff, you know, pretty quick down and dirty demos. But when they lean back into that saddle and that grin mm -hmm. and you can see the wheels turning, like you've, you've just changed everything for them. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, and it's funny you said that because I was thinking those exact words where, cause when you see, cause they're, it's almost astonishment at first because I think they walk into it. Well, I think it's just human nature that when you're trying something new for the first time, you have at minimum a little bit of trepidation, if not yes. a little bit of cynicism of like, eh, I don't know if this is actually going to work or not. Like I'm betting on like, I, I don't think I'm going to like it. It's different. So there's a, there's a hurdle to overcome to start with. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's almost like a look of disbelief or astonishment of like, Holy smokes, man, I couldn't, I would have never thought that it was that easy or that comfortable or that I would feel this, this kind of solid in it or whatever the case is. And to your point, you immediately, they start kind of moving around and now they're envisioning like the hunt out of it. You know, you yeah. can see it happen like where they're looking, like I, I would almost say like they're already picking trees in their mind. We're like, yeah. I could use it in this setup. This is how I would use it in this setup. And then it just becomes a, you know, I think the biggest question I've always gotten getting them in it was the, the hurdle once they got in it they the benefits immediately became obvious to them the next question i always got was about shooting out of it yes. and to me the way i've always explained it to people was i actually shoot better out of my saddle than i ever did a tree stand because i was always worried about where my feet were at in a stand making sure i wasn't walking off the edge of it or whatever the case was to have enough room i was like we're in a saddle I was like, as long as I load my hips, if I load the saddle and just use my, my ass as my anchor, as my foundation, kind of, I was yes. like, I was like, that's whenever I'm solid. I was like, that was the only change you have to make is just like, it's all in your hips and it's all loading your saddle and trusting your gear. You know, once you get to that point, you will be able to shoot as well or better out of that than you have anywhere else. I would say a hundred percent better. And I, I, I would argue that, I mean, you saw, you watched me several times do demos in Harrisburg mm -hmm. and you kind of saw my spiel. And I, you know, one of the things I throw out there as often as I can is for when people do ask that question, well, how do I shoot out of it? And my go-to, because it's just, it just makes sense is that when you're standing on a tree stand or the ground, it doesn't matter your feet that placement of your feet and your your that is the foundation of your shot you're limited by your own balance and how far you can rotate and move from that where your feet are positioned right right so move that foundation over halfway up your body to the bottom of your torso that becomes the foundation for your shot and now you can keep that 
good solid T formation for your shot, keep it consistent and bend and do everything and rotate at the waist, and you can get absolutely silly with shot angles. Yeah. And and stay locked in. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing I noticed for sure is that my form was way better shooting out of a saddle just in general. Like I I didn't have I wouldn't dip my shoulder or do any of those types of things that, that you might do when you're standing on the ground and making sure that you're bending at the waist and stuff like that. Like it just almost forces you to do that naturally by the, by the nature of how you're set up by the nature of like where your foundation is essentially. Right. Yeah. Right. Nice, man. Well, I want to ask you, dude, you know, we kind of done our, we've been talking saddles. I'm sure we'll dive into them again here, but uh, how was your season this year, man? You mentioned you went to, you went to Illinois. You, did you kill that deer that you heard that you heard cough or what was the deal there? I did not. So I was, uh, I was hunting with my recurve. Um, oh, you're which, one of the, you're one of those guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. So no, that, that whole season I've killed, actually killed more. Well, I don't know if I kill more deer now with a recurve than I have a compound after last year, but um, I've spent the most of my adult life hunting with trad deer. Okay. And uh, last year um, I, I hunted with, with my Matthews the entire season. And um, yeah, I killed, I mean, I killed five deer and one coyote. Nice. And, um, no monsters at all. Anybody that knows me, um, knows I am not a big buck killer. I've never claimed to be. I actually, I mean, I'll be the first one to make fun of myself. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm like, Hey, if you want to know how to kill big bucks, go talk to Rendell Eric or Andy May or Jared Schaefer, one of those guys. But if you want to know about the gear that it will help you kill big bucks, I'm your guy <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice when did you uh did you always shoot trad is that always kind of been because that's one of the things that i've got a uh i've got a recurve here at the house truth be told the first year i ever bow hunted i hunted with a recurve and then i just thought that i was like all right that might have been a little aggressive um yeah and you know and then i switched to to a compound um but at some point i would like to uh i would like to spend a couple seasons and then maybe spend seasons going forward using a recurve Mainly what, what kind of did it for me was, was doing as much ground hunting. And as I did in Kansas this year, I was like, man, yeah. the ultimate would just be to kill a slob in Kansas on the ground with a recurve. I was like, I don't know if it could get any better than that. You know? Yeah. It, there's, there's no feeling. Well, the, to back up to first part of your question, I've not always hunted with a recurve. I started off my hunting career as a young man, you know, hunting with the, with the old, uh, martin jaguar i believe um but i started i started hunting with stick bows because i i had this tendency to make things as hard on myself as possible without realizing it like i i'm not going to go hunt fish for trout with a spinning reel i'm going to get a fly rod you know what i mean right right i'm going to add that level of difficulty to it uh, okay so i've killed a few deer with the compound now oh i'm going to use a stick and a string now and you get hooked on it you really do um it's to me it it forces you to become a better woodsman mm -hmm. 100 because your range is limited um you know it's a self-imposed limit range limitation by using um you know traditional gear and you just you have to you have to pick that tree that much better than you would with the, with the compound um just you have to learn that much more about your craft yeah. um and, you know, when, when you're hunting with a stick bow. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm I, at some point, I think I will just kind of make, make the leap because, you know, it's just the up close and personal thing is, is what really excites me about just bow hunting in general. Yeah. And, uh, and then just having to up your craft like that. I know I've talked to guys like Nathan Killen and, and, and stuff like that, who are just, you know, he's a phenomenal like hunter in general, awesome woodsman, but throw on top of it. There's a, there's a particular place that I, that I hunt that is extremely hard to kill any deer aside, you know, big deer, notwithstanding, you know what I mean? Like just anything Pope and young are better. Now this place has giants, like legitimate right. giants. Um, but even killing like 125 inch, 130 inch deer there is hard. Cause like, it's just low deer density. The terrain's grueling. Um, I've hunted it a couple different seasons. I've had one encounter within bow range of a, of a shooter buck in, in a handful of, uh, in a handful of seasons. And Nathan has gone there with traditional equipment, I think three different times in the general area, not the same piece, but in the general area. And I think he's killed three, three good bucks. On, oh, in, wow. Yeah. Like 
he's just, he's next level and he's doing it all with, you know, traditional equipment. And when I say I had one in bow range, you know, that bow range that I had, it was bow range for me for a compound. It would not have been bow range for me with a, with a trad bow, you know, cause he yeah. was probably at 27, 28 yards, which would have been outside my comfort zone of shooting a, a trad bow. Even if, a, even if I was well, well practiced, I still probably, yeah. that would be outside my range. I, I figured out um, year before last that that that, that thirty yard mark was outside of my my range. I, but I figured it out the hard way. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> it's uh, that, that I mean that that's on film. You know, yep. it was that that North Dakota buck that I that I shot that velvet buck with my recurve, and a lot of things went wrong there. But we did everything right from that point on, and so it worked out. But it's um everybody's their own backyard hero. Yeah. You, feet in your own backyard you just can't yeah and but when you get out there and you know an area you're not familiar with or just the woods in general and you're hunting animals that don't want to die and they're constantly moving around um things change quick so i was i was pretty humbled you know i made that terrible shot and I, i i looking back now i'm not gonna say i should have took it because i was comfortable with that range in my backyard but I didn't think about where I was at and what I was doing exactly. And I, I made a poor shot, but I was using the right gear, nice heavy arrows and did a lot of damage and ended up getting him. So, right. uh, but yeah, I learned, you know, I, I learned every time I go out. Um, and it's funny because that we're talking about trad gear. Cause this year I'm actually think I'm going to, I'm going to go all back into it. Again. Are you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've already right. got some bones up and uh, i'm starting to tune and play with some arrows and um yeah and 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 just you haven't you haven't killed the idea with a trad boat yet correct correct no okay it's man i can't even tell you it's a completely different feeling it yeah. completely if i don't care if it's a if it's a button buck it's just uh it, it's just a different feeling when you accomplish that with trad gear um there's nothing like it yeah and shooting trad gear out of the saddle, not an issue at all. You know, I've, I've, it's, I've, I've killed three with a weak side shot with a 62 inch recurve. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's, uh, that's about as hard as it'll, that's about as hard as it'll get right there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. A buddy of mine doesn't live too far from me. He's, uh, I've had him on the podcast before his, uh, his, uh, handle on, uh, Instagram is UP bow hunter. Um, awesome hunter, killer woodsman. He's good buddy with my friend you know, Greg, we, we try to get together in the summer once in a while to just kind of hang out, talk deer. And he's a big, he's a big trad bow hunter, um, as yeah. well. And so we started, that's really kind of what started getting me to think about it a little bit was, uh, we had our kind of summer soiree all together last year and we're chatting and he and I were talking about it a little bit. And, you know, I told him I was interested in it, you know, just, I, I'm a gear guy as well. Like I like to tinker with things. And to me, it's like using traditional equipment kind of takes the, the bow press kind of equation out of it. I can tinker with my own gear probably a little bit more and stuff like that, which I always kind of, kind of like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he's got a couple bows at his house and he was like, Hey, he's like, I have one I'm not using. He's like, I'll, I'll sell it to you, you know, really cheap. He's like the other, he's like the other upside of most trad equipment. He's like, you can buy some ridiculously expensive stuff. He's like, but he's like, you can get really good trad equipment for a fraction of the cost that you will get that you would pay for compound equipment essentially he's 100 correct i mean it's you can go as cheap or as expensive as you want to go you can absolutely crush your your most expensive compound bow setup you've ever had i can point you right at a bow and a quiver and some arrows that'll blow <laughs> that price tag right away. right yeah for sure but you don't have to do that yeah and that's what he was saying he's like i got a bow here he's like i'll sell it to you for 300 bucks he's like and you'll never have to buy another bow do you have it? Did you buy it? No, I didn't. I actually, Do it. I had a, I had a recurve uh, that my dad had of mine because uh, he had two. You know, well, he had his and he had mine because he gave me one and then I, he ended up I, he ended up back with it in his possession. And then the last time I was visiting him, I guess last year before he sold that house and moved back to Pennsylvania, I was like, hey, I was like, can I get my uh, get my recurve back? And he was like, yeah. He's like, you know, as long as you're going to shoot it and keep it. And I was like, well, yeah, I was like, I'm not going to sell it. And I was like, you know, I want to shoot it. So it's in my basement right now. And, uh, I've been staring at it. I need to get some arrows for it and start and start breaking it out. But I don't think I would hunt with this this year. I think I would like to spend a year shooting it and then, okay. and then kind of go and then kind of go from there. Well, I can, I can tell you this. It's 
just put your foot on the gas and go. Yeah. Don't be. <laughs> uh, it's honestly, Clint. I mean, like right now, if you were to start playing with that thing right now, you could be super efficient and super deadly at 15 yards and in all day long. Right. Um, and that's, and honestly with, it's, that's most of my trad kills have been like under yards. Um, and as close as five on the ground, you know, it just, it varies, but, um, well, that's the yeah. reason why I started thinking about it. Is Cause the past, you know, I don't know what, three years or so, you know, every encounter that I've had, um, you know, cause I, I don't know, I've just had some bad luck recently. Well, I won't say bad luck. It just, you know, it's hunting, you know, I've, I've been in, in, in I've been in range and it's brush here or a branch here, or, you know, won't, you know, won't take the two more steps from behind that tree that I need or whatever the case is, you know, and every one of them that I've had in bow range, it's, I think the furthest one's been like 18 yards. Yeah. You know? And so it's like, I'm, that's what got me kind of thinking about it to where I was like, eh, I was like, I'm in. I'm in trad bow range, you know, I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm rarely having encounters where I'm out past, you know, tw- the 20 yard mark at this point. Yeah. And a lot of my setups because of how thick it is, it's like, I'm often not hunting. I'm hunting in places where I probably can't shoot beyond 15 yards. So here's, what's going to happen. So you've, you've had all those encounters and experiences and you're like, man, I'm in trad bow range all day long. Oh, I know so exactly gonna- where you're tra- going with this. <laughs> yeah. You're going to switch your trad bow and <laughs> You're going to have Booners walk by at 33 yards all season. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. But if you just go into it, first of all, don't go out looking for big bucks. Yeah. It's going to happen, happen. Go out and enjoy the process of hunting with trad equipment and em- just embrace that first. Yeah. And you just take the whole giant buck thing out of the equation. You will have so much fun and it will be so enjoyable for you. Uh, that's, that's what I find had to do. I just, just, I told myself, I'm going to start having fun again. I'm going to, you know, you're, you put your own, you're your own worst enemy when it comes to putting pressure on yourself, um, you know, to, to kill big deer. And I just, I, this, this last season, I just quit. I was like, I'm done. I'm just hunting. I'm going to fill up that freezer. And that's exactly what I did. Nice. I bet it felt damn good too. Yep. Best season I've ever had. Nice. So what what's your plans for uh for next year? Where you had you got some uh you got some states on your list of uh to get to to try to to try to kill some whitetails or what? Well, if I can ever get out of my dungeon, which is behind <laughs> my sewing machine, um, I might go somewhere. Right. Uh, yeah, I I uh I think I definitely want to go back up to North Dakota. That's okay. on my hit list. Um, I might. I, I've got this huge desire to go spot and stalk mule deer hunting again. I haven't been in several years. And I want to do that. Um, might pop over to Illinois, Indiana. I'm not going to go far from Missouri. Okay. Um, just time constraints and other responsibilities and stuff. Um, so yeah, nothing crazy epic. I never put in for, for, for draw tags. Um, if I can't go over the counter, I just generally won't do it. Um, you know, it's just yeah. because that I'm in total control of it. You know, if yeah. I want to, if I, 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 hey, I'm going to go hunt in Indiana for three days in two weeks. It's got to hop in the truck and I go. Yeah. It's- no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, there's a hand, there's really only two states right now that I will draw for, that I put in for points. One is Iowa, just because it's one of those things where I'm only ever going to be able to go every four to five years. So I'm only ever going to get to do that a handful of times in my life. And it's just, yeah, that's one of those places I tell someone if they hunt whitetails, man, like you got to do it at least once in your life because it is, it's an experience that you probably won't ever have again, you know, um, in a lot of cases, you know, Kansas is the other place that I do like to go. It's, it's a lottery. I mean, you can draw, you can get a point and you're guaranteed a tag, but if you don't have a point, I think it's like an 80% draw odds or something like that. So it's, it's all, but over the counter essentially for, you know, for a big buck state. Um, and, and this year I'm actually going, I got my tag looking at me right now. I'm going to Idaho to hunt some elk this year. So, Nice. I'm gonna do that, which will be which will be cool. And I actually just put in with uh, my buddy Chad. Well, you guys, you know Chad. You did a you did the Exodus podcast with uh, with those guys. Yeah. Yeah. He he got me in on this group where he's got some buddies who have like Western hunt. I don't want to say Western hunting down, but they they do really really well on DIY. Like pretty much one guy, if I'm not mistaken, fills tags pretty much every hunt every year. Oh wow. Um, 
and and he's been doing it for years and so he's got a lot of little like gem spots and in a bunch of different states kind of picked out and he basically has a revolving door of you know like states that he can basically draw every year like he's going somewhere to hunt elk somewhere it's a draw state or whatever um and he has a a guy, I forget what the company's name is, but they'll kind of manage your points for you and make sure that you're, you know, if you want to do it as a group and make sure that you have all the same points and all the same areas for the right units and stuff like that. And for whatever species you want. So I got in on that group this year to make sure that like I'm getting accruing my points that way every year within like the next couple of years, I'll have a different state to go to every year. So I can hunt Utah, I can hunt Wyoming, I can go back to Montana. Uh, don't have to, it's a lottery, I think for New Mexico, but you try to put in for New Mexico early. And then if you draw that, then you go there. If you don't draw it, then you try to get, you try to use your points to draw in another state you have points for. So That's it's just right. kind of like a whole process. I love travel hunting. It's one of my favorite things to do. So I was like, you know what? I want to, I want to do this so I can get like the next like five to 10 years kind of mapped out to where I know I'm going to go on some really cool like adventure hunts every year. Yeah. Um, and then just, you know, know that that's going to be what I'm, what I'm doing. I'm going to be going somewhere every fall. I just don't know where. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. I, you know, I've, I've done a few backpack hunts out West. Um, you know, I, I never brought anything home, but, um, I mean, true DIY, I mean, over the counter, you know, Colorado tags, that type of thing. All right. And it's, it can be very frustrating, but at the same time, you, you can feel very accomplished even coming home empty handed. You learn so much. You learn about, lot about yourself, especially when you're going solo, like I have, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, completely different um realm out of your comfort zone and yeah. it's it's good for the soul i guess is what i'm trying to say and it's it's just being able to hop in, in your your truck and just go yeah it, it there's a lot to be said for that and i i i think more people are starting to kind of do that and get their head around it and and i guess it's not even a risk really you know it's just an adventure right yeah yeah, it's it's one of my favorite things to do. Like, I just love the DIY. Like, you know, I've I've done the Montana thing with a buddy of mine that lives out there. That was a DIY kind of backcountry deal, you know, and I've not been back out west since. And this was kind of my way of, like, making sure that I make it out west, you know, for the next however however long and do a handful of DIY hunts, you know, while I can. Because that's the thing, it's right? Like, those DIY western hunts, you can really only do those but for so long until your body won't let you do it anymore to a degree. You, you know what I mean? Right. And, and so I, you know, that was kind of my thinking where I was like, you know what, if I want to do this, I probably have another good 10 to 15 years, probably 15 years in me of being able to do that at a, at a level or a, a rate that I would deem, you know, worthy of spending my time doing it. I was like, if I'm going to do that, then I was like, I need to kind of, I need a plan, you know, to map out these points and stuff like that. So I can make sure I'm, I'm hitting all these places I want to see. Cause part of it's not just the hunt and the adventure. It's like, I want to go spend time out in the wilderness and all these places, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And like getting to hunt and do it at the same time. Like that's the, that's the bonus. There's so many beautiful places out there to go that, that you know, people, you, people just don't have any idea. I mean, this is a big, big world and there's yeah. a lot and we'll never even scratch the surface of it as individuals really for the yeah. most part. Exactly. Um, so yeah, just turn the key and go. That's right, man. So I want to transition here and I want to talk a little bit, you know, about, you know, jump back into, back into saddle hunting here. So, you know, you were talking about spending, I, I gave you that introdu introduction as the, uh, the, uh, the sewing machine Messiah and the, in the Juki jungle ninja earlier, because you are the sewing master kind of behind, behind tethered, <laughs> you know, and I, and I kind of, I, I always kind of marvel at, you know, companies you know, who are constantly kind of pushing the envelope or creating new ideas and stuff like that. Because I look at certain things and I'm like, you know, a certain product line and I'd be like, man, I don't know what else someone would do. Like they've, they've figured it all out, you know? And then, and then like six months later, another cool product comes out, you know? So I'm always just curious, like, how do you guys keep innovating and keeping the ideas fresh? Is it, is it a group effort on, on y'all's part or does this fall on one guy or, or is there a group like within tethered and outside of tethered that you guys kind of all rely on to kind of ideate? Well, here's, here's the golden rule, number one. It doesn't matter whose idea it is, Greg always takes credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to happen. Every good idea that Tether has ever had, it was Greg's idea. So we'll just get that out of the way. All right, well, hold on. I, I, I have something that can refute that. 
All right. Because <laughs> whenever I first met Greg, however many years ago this was now, like three years ago, or maybe it was four years ago now, uh, Tethered was just launching. I don't, I don't know how long like the site had been up, a couple weeks or something like that, maybe. And he, he came on the podcast and I wasn't hunting out of a saddle yet. And he was like, you're going to love it. I'm going to send you some stuff. You're going to love it. And I was like, all right, cool. I was like, I'll try it out. So he can't take credit for the Predator platform because I literally have one that on the side of it, it says Ernie's Outdoors. Oh, wow. Yeah, you got a unicorn there, man. Yeah, I got, a, I, got a, I got like the OG prototype that came from probably Ernie's garage somewhere or something like that at, at one point. So he might try to take credit for everything else, but the Predator platform, I'm going to call bullshit on that one. No, it, it's kind of a running joke within the <laughs> group. That um, yeah, that that Greg just automatically takes credit for him for <laughs> every idea, whether it was his or not. So, right. but no, it's it really is. I mean, obviously, we are a group of individuals, and as individuals, we do have our own ideas, but we collectively put those ideas together, and then everybody puts input into them for the most part. Um, but first and foremost, I think one of the reasons that we are able, we've been able to accomplish what we have. Um, as far as innovations and, and just kind of keeping our foot on the gas, as I like to say, um, is we listen. We listen to the community. We listen to people. We listen to feedback. You know, when these guys come in the booths and at these shows and they, they show us their, their, their deer pictures and where they were saddle hunting and certain setups and how they were doing things, we pay attention, especially whenever they say, hey, you know, this would be kind of cool or if this feature had this, this saddle had this or, you know, if this stick was like this, we pay attention to that stuff. And um, I, I think that's one of the reasons that we're able to do what we're able to do is because we listen to, to the community, number one. And we are, I don't want to sound too brazen when I say this, but we are truly that hold my beer mentality. Yeah. Yeah, like, don't tell me we can't do something, you know, because yep. stand by and walk. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. how we. Yeah, exactly. And you kind of have to be, you know what I mean? Um, you know, yes. whenever you're trying to push the envelope and things, because, you know, otherwise you don't really come up with new ideas. You come up with ideas that have been kind of looked at or, 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 you know, or done before. I, one of the things that I, you know, you and I got to know each other a little bit at the booth in, in Harrisburg. And the one thing that really struck me you know, and this is going off the beaten path of, of innovation, but when you were talking about, you know, you listen to your community, right? And the explanation, whenever someone was asking about the one sticks and stuff like that, and there's a, there's a second run that's coming in, in, in the, in how you kind of described like the engineering aspect of what you guys were doing, like the humility and the transparency of what goes on with you guys is, is the thing to me that it creates an amount of trust with the between you guys and the community right to where yeah. it's like you guys feel like you're part of the community not a company trying to sell products to the community there's a big difference yeah and it's i mean you know tether was born of of saddle hunters and hunter, hunters in general you know i mean that's just how we how we took shape so yeah that has a lot to do i mean with the success that we've had and the products that we've been able to innovate um you know, and, and the people do put a lot of trust and a lot of faith in us, and we appreciate that every day. You know, it's uh, but it is hard to, it's very hard to invent a brand new product. I mean, you know, we yeah. didn't create, we, we brought it kicking and screaming into the modern age with new engineering, new designs, new materials, you know, and you know, really kind of took it mainstream. But most, from what I've seen in my experience, most great things that you're we're able to create or just any company in general, not even saddle hunting company, they're based off things that already exist. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's relatively easy to make little tweaks and improvements on existing products. That's very, very hard to come up with completely out of the box, brand new products, you know? Um, but we just, we just keep going all the time. We, we, we talk to each other all the time. We're always bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, and when we all get together in one place, in one room, holy crap, the, the, the juices get flowing big time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I know just from, from my own personal experience, you know, of, of talking, whether it's with 
Greg or Taylor or whomever is saying, like, always ask me, like, hey, you know, when you're using this, like, what, what did you think? You know, wh how did this work for you? Or just looking for feedback, constant, like, improvement. Is there anything that, that isn't working the way that you, that you think it should or, or whatever the case is? Or, hey, use this, try this out and see if you can break it. Like, I always love that one. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like, that's, yeah. that's always a good one. Hey, we got this thing we want you to try out. See if you can bust this, you know, um, yeah. but just, which kind of is a nice kind of like, and I didn't even plan it, but that was a nice segue into talking about the testing process that you guys go through. Cause that's one of the things aside from, you know, all the awesome stuff that we talked about as far as, you know, the comfort and, you know, the shootability out of the, out of it and out of the saddle and, and, and all those things we kind of touched on earlier the thing that I always kind of come back to whenever people are like, yeah, I like it, you know, and, and they'll ask me why I use it. You know, why do I use tethered versus any, anyone else or whatever? And mm -hmm. my response is always like, like I mentioned earlier, my number one goal when I go out to hunt somewhere is to come back home. Sure. And the amount of testing and stuff that you guys go through and the transparency that you guys have around your testing was the, actually was the first thing that I noticed. You know, once I once I met Greg and we talked and he sent me some stuff or whatever and I checked some stuff out, like the first thing I kind of looked at was the testing that you guys were going through and like you've done testing videos and stuff like that. So the thing for me was always like this, this stuff is great, but in order for me to trust something that's brand new, because a lot of people like we were talking about before are coming to this pretty new when, when we were talking about before where they're kind of coming to you vulnerably and looking, seeking information because they, they have either very little or zero experience with it. You know, right. the, the testing and the safety aspect of it is is paramount. And that's pro that's one of the things that, you know, whenever I was new to it and getting into it was that I wanted to look into, you know, and, you know, can you I guess, can you talk to me a little bit about how you guys go through testing and what that process looks like before you actually ever put anything out uh, out to the market? Yeah. So, um, you know, whenever we first became a company, we we knew that we I mean, th this is this is. um potentially life-saving equipment. I mean, you're holding your life in, in this saddle or, or this rope or whatever from 20 feet up in the air. It needs to work and then some. Mm -hmm. So we, initially, we, you know, we, just, we just followed the TMA standards, you know, the Tree Stand Manufacturing Association standards um, of how they test platforms and tree stands and sticks and climbing ladders and all that stuff. And we, and we kind of did that. And I found out really quick when I was doing the initial testing on the saddles, especially that the types of drops that we were doing with these things, it, it, it's pretty much a physical impossibility to even get yourself into that type of situation in a saddle to begin with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, just for instance, you know, one of the, the uh, just an absolutely brutal drop. And I, I know that we, there's video clips of it out there somewhere that we've done is the lineman loops, lineman's loop drops um, with a 300 pound steel dummy in the saddle. And basically it equates to about a six foot drop. And that 300 pound steel dummy is weighing about 1800 pounds at the bottom of that drop. Now, is the saddle ruined? You bet, it's ruined. But did the dummy hit the ground? No, never have. And that's just, you know, we just over-engineered stuff and we were able to do that, I guess, a lot of it had to do with the materials that I was talking about earlier, new yeah. material, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we just, we subject this stuff to the testing that you, as a human being, you cannot inflict the type of, of um, damage or um, stresses to this gear that it will, that it will sustain. It's insane what this stuff will sustain. Yeah, and the gear in the in the materials that you guys are, guys are choosing, just like you know, using Dyneema bridges and things like that, where it's like you still uh, retain the lightweight kind of bulk free, you know, aspect of of you know what saddle hunting is kind of all all about, but you also get the added advantage of it being like the most ridiculously strong you know rope that you'll ever lay your hands on. <laughs> you it know is, what I mean? It, yeah, the the, the Dyneema fibers. Um you know, the ultra light molecular polyethylene material. It, it's, I believe pound for pound, it is the strongest, lightest fiber on synthetic material on the planet. Um, it's stronger than steel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just, it's absolutely 
insane what its capabilities are. I mean, you look take the you know our one sticks and the Skeletor sticks. Um, you know, we're running like an eighth inch Dyneema on those, and it's got right at a two thousand pound braking strength. Um, it's very hard. It, it's very hard for people to wrap their head around that stuff sometimes when they when they come into the booths and the shows and they're looking and they're like, two thousand pounds? Are you serious?" I'm like, "Yes, I am. I'm yeah. serious." I know, I know. It's a, the one my my buddy that old timer that I got got into it. That was his first question. He's like, you know, he was looking at the bridge and he was like, "That's what you hang from." And I'm like, "Yeah." I was like, "I was like, man, I, I don't remember the the exact rating, but I want to say it was something like six thousand pounds when it's quarter inch right, or six thousand or seven thousand pounds, something like that." Just shy of eight thousand. Just shy of eight thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I told him that, and he was like, "Are you kidding me?" I'm like, "His name's Tate." I was like, "Tate, I could pull your truck around with this thing." I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I was like. You got nothing, nothing to, uh, nothing to worry about. But, uh, so man, you know, transitioning from that dude, you know, speaking about materials, you know, I know, well, first congratulations on winning, you know, best new product at ATA for what was it? The third year in a row now? Is that what it was? Three. Um, no, it wasn't a three. Well, they didn't have the ATA year before last. So nobody went to that. But, uh, yeah. So 20, 2020, we had the phantom. Yep. And, um, yeah, then we got the uh, the the Vader carbon fiber platform this year. Yeah, so and, you, so you had a so you had a back to back rather since they didn't have it yeah. the year before. Nice. So, did you hear about the rumor floating around over that? No, I didn't. So yeah, the the rumor mill. I haven't confirmed it. So, but the rumor mill was that we actually won with first place with um, the carbon fiber platform and supposedly we won something with the Skeletors, but they, they didn't feel right giving Tether two of the, two of the three awards. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's funny, a, dude. It was funny. You know? That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so it's the, the Vader, is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, during the introductory video, after we won at ATA, Greg called it the Vader. So I guess that's what it's going to be. <laughs> well, Hey, since he came up with it and he should name it then. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So talk to me about that, man. How did that come about? So that's a, a carbon, a carbon flat uh, platform. How, what, you know, what was the process or what did, you know, the, you know, creation of that well, look like? And when do you think it might, what people might be able to get their hands on it? Uh, there's a lot of secret sauce involved in that carbon fiber platform. Yeah. Um, and I'm not at liberty to get into. Yeah. Uh, but obviously it was uh, some of the most brilliant minds in saddle hunting were involved in that um and uh people who have been known to work on space shuttles i'll say that um it, it got pretty intense so yeah it's um it's a very special product it's you know and and um we're super happy with the results we've had with as far as the testing stuff thus far nice. um we some tweaks and stuff to make to it uh but the game plan right now tentatively is to have this thing ready for a fall launch um i've i'm being told that that's that's looking like a very real possibility um so that would be like uh sometime after the fourth of july right right nice man that's pretty exciting to uh, yeah. be, be here in time for uh for hunting season be pretty uh pretty killer and then yeah. what, what are the what are the tentative specs on that as far as like size and stuff like that in comparison to the current predator uh, of the or the xl so the rough math on it, it has an X, a Predator XL profile, um, but it comes in at a regular Predator weight. Mm, um, nice. Yeah. X, XL profile with a sub three pound. Yeah, that's pretty significant there, man, especially for those folks that like that, that bigger platform. Yes. You know? and, but the coolest thing to me about this entire thing, it's not the weight. It's the, it's the properties that carbon fiber brings to the table. Especially the one the thing foot. I've been hearing is like the foot warmth because of yeah. like the metal, you know, it, especially on those cold days. Cause I can attest, like, I don't care if you're in a, on a saddle platform or a stand or whatever. It's like, if you're standing on metal and it's like 20 degrees outside, your, your feet are cold. Yeah. It's either, I don't know how, how this, how the science works, but it's either zapping heat out of your boot or it's injecting cold from the steel through it. I don't know how, how it works, but either way it's happening. And um, you know, carbon is known for being um, more of a warm to the touch, a softer type feel, and it doesn't it doesn't transfer that cold um, like metal does. Right. I don't think I don't know if my 
my science is right here, but I want to say warmth moves towards cold. If I'm remembering like the thermo blah 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 correctly from whatever science class I had, I want to say yeah, I, I want to say that's what it is, but don't quote me on that. I I probably missed that day. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you were trad bow hunting. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> it, yeah. I, I kind of for the most part, um, I stay out of the design circles for like the climbing sticks, the platforms. That's generally um, a an Ernie and Garrett mm-hmm. Garrett Prawl, um type of thing. I mean, I do have input in there. All of us do, but that they kind of specialize in that type of thing. Um, whereas I, I'm more, if it's a soft good or a sewn product, that that's my wheelhouse. That's where I thrive at. Right, right. So speaking of that, you know, what is what's something that you're really really excited about right now that you're working on, you know, you don't have to necessarily give any details around. I don't want to give away in, you know, any of your secret sauce or anything like that, but just generally speaking, what's a, uh, what's in the hopper that's got you really pumped. Oh man. It's uh, I don't know how much to say here. <laughs> <laughs> well, all you need to say is Greg came up with it. So <laughs> yeah. well, uh, it's yeah, it's uh, I'm staring at it right now. One of them, but it's, um, yeah, we've been working on we've been working on a little project for the last two years, and if if if, if people just watch watch a lot of the hunting videos from the past two seasons, you know, just look at stuff that people are wearing and different things, and you can probably put put the puzzle pieces together. I I just as much as I want to just one hundred percent spill the beans on it, I'm I'm I'm. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm a little hamstrung here at the moment. Yeah, so. well, I, I, without giving anything away, I will say that it is something that saddle hunters have been constantly looking for uh, as long as I can uh, remember, and they've not yep. found a 100% solution for it because they've had to use, they've had to kind of go to companies that don't make saddle-specific gear for this particular thing. How's Very that? Well. How's that for a roundabout way of saying something? There you go. Yeah. You're a politician, there, right? Man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I work in marketing and advertising, dude. Like, we, we, all I do is say stuff without saying stuff all day long. <laughs> you know, so I'm an, yeah. I'm an expert at it. No, I, I mean, well, you, you kind of know a little bit about it. Yeah. I mean, what do you, what, what do you think initially? Um, I'm super pumped. Um, it's good. It's been something that I've been I've been looking for. We were talking a little a little bit off air before we started recording about my plight of trying to find something in this in this vein. Um, and Greg, I talked to Greg a little bit about it at the show in Harrisburg, and you know, kind of knew where what direction things might be headed and stuff like that. And you were able to kind of show me a, a, a picture of of, of some uh, uh, examples, if you will. And yeah. it. Uh, I will just say this, that, uh, people that are into saddle hunting are going to be very pleased. We'll just put it, put it that way. And I, uh, look forward to getting an early one to try to break it. How's that? <laughs> Good luck breaking this, my friend. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, again, you know, you, you've touched on it before. Um, as far as, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here, but man, we're making it a lot more round. It's yeah. uh, that that's we're just, we're just trying to put everything that's needed um, and nothing you don't yeah. just to make you excel that much more in the saddle hunting realm, you yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. And this will definitely be, you know, a, uh, a, a piece that'll, that'll start to, that'll fill that puzzle piece void, if you will. Um, this sl- what's that? My, this is going to be a slam dunk in my opinion. It's be- because of the time and effort that we've put into it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with you. And like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, uh, uh, becoming available. And then we won't, we won't say any more about that. Cause Greg will get mad that we're, we, that we're talking about his idea. We'll have to have him back yeah. on later to, to talk about it and launch it. Um, <laughs> man, I've had you on here for over an hour now. I got one more question for you. I want to be sensitive to your time so you can get your beauty sleep in your, uh, in your cuff, comfy hotel before you gotta, before you gotta, uh, trade show it up tomorrow. But, uh, what are the three pieces of gear? that the sewing machine messiah can't live without other than my sewing machines other than yeah you got to take out your sewing machines hunting gear related what are the three pieces of gear that you can't live without 
Okay. Um, well, I would say, no, you're kind of asking me a loaded question there. I, think, <laughs> I mean, my phantom saddle, my single stick, and as silly as it sounds, the hiss strap. Honestly, yeah, that, that it, little is amazing and so versatile. Um, hundred percent agree. Like that would yeah. be those would be probably the three things that that I would that I would pick. I always kind of go back and forth between like. What I usually say if someone asks me that is I, is I usually caveat it and say, this is my politician way of getting out of it, right? So what I say usually say is like, all right, well, so obviously my my, my Phantom Saddle and my my, plat, my Predator platform, like all the staple stuff that I use. And then I say, well, and then here are like the things that aren't related to like my core setup. You know what I mean? Um, the, my one that I'm always, uh, that I love, you know, that's not my staple kind of saddle gear, the, all the things you mentioned is actually my uh is my boots i've had the worst time trying to find a good pair of boots like for years i could not find a pair that either didn't hurt my feet or didn't start leaking and breaking down within like six months and so that's that's a that's okay i kind of see the direction you were you were going with that i guess i didn't really understand the the, yeah the the normal saddle gear excluded um yeah that's an awesome point and yeah my crispy thors I don't go anywhere with that. Yeah. They, the, the saddle hunting boot, in my opinion. Yeah. My buddy, Chad wears those. He really likes those. I've actually been this past year. I wore a uh, kind of Trek hard scrabbles this year. And that was, uh, that was a really good boot for me. Um, yeah. I just, yeah, those are not, yeah. Yeah. They're, they were a little bit of a break in period, but once, once you got them broken in um, and they didn't take nearly as long as I, th- as I thought that they would. Um, yeah, but once they got broken in, like they're, they're sweet, they've stayed waterproof. I beat the piss out of them this past year and they're still rocking and rolling. I used to wear a lot of hikers and stuff like that just cause they're so light and comfy. Yeah. They break in quick, but those things would last like Solomon's. I love them like for comfort. Um, but I mean, I would get maybe six months out of them and that would be it. Like I would get through part of my scouting season and they would, they would already be trash. So what, what what's the issue that you were having? Were you wearing the shank out or wearing the boot itself out? Uh, wearing the, the boot itself out. So I would usually start to get water ingress, usually right around where my toes would bend. And they would just start to get all kinds of tore up. And I've actually had, you know, soles start to separate from the boot itself and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Um, I don't really know why. I thought they would last longer. I mean... I didn't think that I was really abusing them any more than anyone else would abuse them necessarily. Um, yeah. But I do traverse back and forth. I mean, I got a fair amount of swamp or wet areas around here. So it's a lot of swamp, briar, thick, nasty stuff where your boots are just kind of getting sliced and diced up. And then yeah. they're also going from being really, really wet to not at all. Um, even during like the scouting season. So it's not just during hunting season. It's scouting season. I'm still dealing with, you know, water and, and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know if it was a combination of that and that they just started, you know, they weren't meant to kind of take that type of abuse. I don't know, but yeah, well, Kenneth Trek makes a great boot. Um, yeah, I would, I've been on two elk hunts in Kenneth Treks and, and the, yeah, they're, they're awesome boots. Um, yeah, I mean, this for me, um, I, I own three pairs of these stores now. Um, one gen one, I think two gen twos. And, um, I absolutely love them on a plat, especially, you know, cause when you're on a platform, you know, I like to say when we live on the edge of that platform. We, yeah, we're moving the edge a lot, um, and I've just found that the the the, the shank that the Thor has um, really is conducive with hunting on the edge of the platform. Yeah, and I, I recently, um, since we're talking about boots, I have struggled for years to keep my feet warm. Struggled, struggled, struggled. I've spent thousands of dollars on quote unquote insulated boots, and I finally just dumbed it down. And I bought a pair of those um, Arctic Shield boot covers. Yep. Done. Game over. Yep. I, I, I mean, I'm running Thors all season long, non-insulated boots. And then whenever I need them, I've got those Arctic Shield boot covers. I, I'm i like, where have you been all my life? Yeah. I, I, I took a set of those when I went to, when I went to Iowa 
uh, whatever it was, three or four years ago. And I, I got a set of them just because I was supposed to get some gnarly cold temperatures. And I'm the same way. I always had a problem keeping my feet warm and I was wearing, you know, insulated boots or whatever they were. And, you know, just realized that, like part of my problem was I just need to keep my feet dry because my feet sweat. You know, and so I was like, well, I need to get rid of the insulation so my feet don't start sweating, you know, necessarily or unnecessarily rather. Um, and then I did use the Arctic Shields, but I've actually taken it one step further. So my buddy got to give a give props to my buddy, Byron Horton. He actually is the guy who turned me on to this. Instead of using my Arctic Shields now, what I do is I take a pair of thick wool socks and I cut them off about halfway and I literally just pull the socks on over top my boots about back midway of my of my foot if i can just Real. keep my the toes warm or whatever on that part of my boot warm or that part of my foot warm i'm good to go so i've actually so gotten, what's that over the, put that over the outside of your boot yep and i so I've, I've not used the arctic shield since then because i just always carry as soon as the season starts even when it's warm out so i don't ever forget them i just take that one pair of socks that i've cut off the right length throw them in the bottom of my pack and then they're with me all season long if i need them i, I throw them on so are these like the heaviest merino socks that you can find is what you're doing this yeah, with? Yeah, these weren't even I don't even think these were merino. Um I think they were just like an old set of like Carhartt wool socks that someone gave me for like a Christmas present for like a hunting sock Christmas present at some point or something like that. And it was just a pair that I never wear cuz they're just too big. Um yeah. and so I just you know, I cut them off and stretched them out to where they would slide over my boot easy enough while I'm in my saddle and good to go. Huh. Especially if you take a hot hand and throw in there with it you're good interesting like on top of your toes throw a hot hand on top of your toes like put your pull the sock on or the socks on and slip yeah. a hot hand on top of your toes and you know inside the sock then you're you're golden then at that point but i've never used i've never really even had to do that i just i just slipped the sock on and i'm good did you hear me what'd you say i said did we just create a new product <laughs> we might have just created a new product <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I'm building this thing in my head i'm like oh, hey i can put a little Gore-Tex on that thing and a little sleeve for a, a hot pocket to go in there or hot hands. I'm like, hey. dude, I'm telling you, Greg, you ain't taking this one. This was no. uh... <laughs> it's all clean. All clean. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Well, hey, dude, I appreciate you coming on. It was good catching up with you, man. I'm glad we got to meet at the Harrisburg show. Um, yeah. I, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Always, always enjoy talking to you. Hopefully I'll see you at, uh, at TAC in, uh, in Seven Springs this year. Yep, looking forward to it, man. Hey, and I appreciate you yeah, you having bet. me on. Yeah, you bet, man. Before you uh, before you run, let people know where they can find out more about you, where they can follow you, and where they can get all Tethered's information. Um, yeah, as far as Tethered's information, you know, tetherednation.com is our website. Uh, you find us on Tethered Nation uh, YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram. And uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're kind of all over social. But yeah, just search Tethered Nation and you will come across us. Awesome, brother. Hey, man, you enjoy the uh, the Iowa show. Uh, travel safe to all the rest of the shows, and I'll see you soon. Will do. Thanks, man. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. If you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there as well. I'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Spartan Forge, Exodus, and Skull Brew Coffee Company. And until next time, we'll see y'all. Oh, 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 oh,